2015. My name's Jeff Sutton. I sit on the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, and I'm fortunate to moderate today's, uh, well, the final show showcase panel of the 2011 convention. So our topic is a federal sunset law. More specifically, should Congress pass a general federal sunset law, providing that most or at least many federal laws expire after, say, 20 years, unless both houses of Congress and the President reenact the law? The concept of a general federal sunset law is relatively new. The concept of a statute that comes with a specific expiration date is not new. The Sedition Act of 1798, quite cleverly, had a clause terminating it in 1801, basically once the election was done, as it turned out after Adams left office. Perhaps a little more legitimately, our first national banks had sunset provisions. The first bank of the United States is chartered in February 1791. Charter lasted 20 years. In 1811, Congress debated whether to renew the charter, and the measure failed by one vote in the House. The charter expired. Five years later, Congress chartered the second National Bank of the United States, the one at issue in McCullough versus Maryland. That's in April 1816. It too had a 20-year expiration date. Congress did not renew the charter again. In 1836, however, the bank continued for five years as a private institution, and then in 1841 went bankrupt. There was not a third national bank, but relatedly, in 1913, Congress passed the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. It did not have a sunset provision, and as of yet, has not gone bankrupt. So the concept of a sunset provision is not new, but the idea behind a general federal one that applies to most law is relatively new. We have a terrific group of panelists to discuss the topic. None of them needs a flattering introduction, and none of, it, as it turn, none of them, as it turns out, wants one. I asked them. <laughs> so let me briefly identify them in the order in which they will speak. Professor Tom Merrill, the Charles Evans Hughes Professor of Law at Columbia, who has written many articles and books. Philip Howard, a partner at Covington and Burling, who has written many articles and books. Professor William Eskridge, the John Garver Professor of Jurisprudence at Yale, who has written many articles and books. <laughs> and the Chief Judge of the Seventh Circuit, Frank Easterbrook, who has written many articles and books, and even a few opinions. Professor Merrill. Thank you very much, Judge. Um, I thought I'd start by providing uh, some overview about sunset provisions. They, they come in uh, various forms. You can have a, a law that has a sunset provision. You can have a, a program uh, that has a sunset provision. A, an agency can have a sunset uh, or even an agency regulation can have a sunset. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, during the time the Constitution was being deliberated, wrote a letter to James Madison recommending that the Constitution have a sunset clause, uh, terminating uh, after 19 years, which I guess was uh, uh, Jefferson's idea of uh, one generation. Um, at least uh, I think we can all agree in that respect it was good that uh, sunset was not uh, adopted. Uh, uh, in addition to having various types of sunsets, uh, uh, it also seems that there are uh, multiple motivations or reasons uh, for having uh, sunsets. Uh, the modern history of sunset laws really starts, uh, like many other innovations in this country, in the late 1960s. Uh, um, a political scientist uh, named Theodore Lowy uh, at Cornell wrote a book with the uh, intriguing title, The end of liberalism. Uh, and uh, at the end of this uh, long and somewhat rambling book, uh, Lowy suggested that uh, uh, one uh, remedy for what he called liberalism, which I think most of us would call something like interest group pluralism, uh, one remedy for this, uh, which would return power to the people uh, in a more kind of left progressive fashion, was to adopt something that he called the Tenure of Statutes Act, which would put time limits of um, uh, a certain number of years on all uh, 
uh, statutes creating federal administrative agencies. Uh, such a reform, he argued, would help break up the capture of administrative agencies uh, by uh, interest groups and would help uh, return uh, power to the people. Uh, uh, shortly after Lowy wrote his book, A Common Cause, which was a, uh, at that time at least, a somewhat influential reform group, uh, sort of a good government group, uh, seized upon Lowy's idea. Uh, and uh, it uh, cleverly changed the name from the Tenure of Statutes Act to the Sunset uh, Law idea. And Common Cause began lobbying uh, for the adoption of Lowy's idea. It had a good deal of traction in the uh, United States Congress. Um, a bill uh, co-sponsored by uh, Senator Ed Muskie of Maine and Senator Charles Percy of Illinois called the Sunset Act of 1978 actually passed the Senate uh, it would have provided for a, a general sunset provision uh, of ten, 10 years for federal, every uh, federal uh, uh, agency program. It failed in the House, however. But Common Cause had a great deal more success at the state level. Uh, starting with Colorado in 1976, uh, the Common Cause uh, people succeeded in persuading at its peak in 1981 36 different states uh, to adopt some type of sunset uh, review statute. Uh, after that, the uh, phenomenon appeared to begin to wane, uh, and by 1990, uh, a significant number of the 36 states had dropped out. They'd either repealed uh, their laws or had, uh, were no longer actively pursuing sunset review. Uh, interest seems since then to have diminished sufficiently that I was unable to find a more current tally of the states that still engage in sunset review, if any. Uh, in the late 1970s, the purpose of uh, Sunset Review seemed to shift. The, er the first impetus from Theodore Lowy was a kind of a left progressive uh, 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 aspiration to uh, eliminate agency capture by corporations and make law uh, more sort of progressively populist in nature. By the late 70s, uh, the concern that a tax revolt had happened in California. Uh, the deregulation movement was mounting in Washington, and the concern was more with eliminating um, bloated bureaucracies and the waste of taxpayer money. So the sunset idea was sort of reconceptualized at that time as a device for cutting down on big government uh, and eliminating uh, wasteful uh, agency regulation. Um, this appears to be the primary motivation for uh, most of the states that adopted sunset laws around that time period. A third rationale for sunset laws, which um, uh, perhaps can be uh, seen in the Sedition Act that Judge Sutton referred to, uh, or, the, uh, or the national uh, banking laws in the early 19th century, uh, uh, also emerged in the 1970s and continues to this day, which I would call a sort of experimentalist uh, motivation. Uh, this comes about because, as you can well imagine, there are many uh, situations where somebody proposes a new law or a program uh, another group is opposed to it, and then there's a third group that's kind of sitting on the fence and is not so sure this is a good idea or not. Uh, and uh, the proponents frequently respond to this by saying, well, let's give it a try and we'll put a sunset provision in uh, so that the program will expire after a few years. And we can then see how it's worked out in practice, what sort of experience we have with it. Uh, and if it turns out to be a good idea, we can make it permanent at that time. And if not, we'll just let it go away. A uh, series of research and development tax credits adopted in the 1990s all had sunset provisions apparently uh, motivated by the desire to uh, convince fence setters that this was a good idea. Uh, the United States uh, Patriot Act that was adopted shortly after the 9-11 terrorist attacks included a sunset provision uh, which presumably was also motivated by some similar concerns. A fourth and relatively recent reason for sunset provisions uh, needs to be mentioned, if only because of its enormous political ramifications, which we are witnessing uh, this very uh, time period. Uh, this is the use of sunset provisions to bring tax legislation into compliance with congressional budget resolutions. Both the 2001 and 2003 Bush tax, cut had, tax cuts had 10-year sunset provisions attached to them in order to bring the Congressional Budget Office estimates of costs down to levels consistent with budget res resolutions. Uh, this, of course, has had a huge impact on current politics uh, since both the 2001 and 2003 acts, uh, uh, in order to remain in effect, require the signature of President Obama uh, attached to legislation perpetuating them, uh, which has dramatically affected the uh, bargaining between the uh, Congressional Republicans and the White House uh, over these issues, as I'm sure you're all aware. 
Finally, for sake of completeness, I should note that some academics have argued for sunsets in order to clear the books of obsolete laws. The argument here is that the statute books get filled up over time with outmoded provisions that are rarely enforced, uh, and that this can have a chilling effect uh, on some people and perhaps lead to prosecutorial abuses. The most uh, interesting idea along these lines was that of Professor, now Judge Guido Calabresi, who was originally scheduled to be on this panel, who argued that judges uh, should be given an inherent power uh, to uh, sunset laws on essentially grounds of desuetude. Uh, whatever the merits of this argument uh, for eliminating obsolete laws, this particular idea does not seem to have attracted the support of any political institution uh, like a legislature. Uh, my co-panelists, I think, will address at uh, greater detail uh, some of the uh, some examples of sunsets in practice and whether they work or don't work. Um, uh, let me just offer a few uh, summary thoughts about that. Uh, the most comprehensive study of state sunset laws was done by a political scientist in 1990 um, who looked at all the low A common cause inspired sunset provisions that had been adopted by the states up to that time. The study indicated that sunset laws had achieved some success when they were first adopted in eliminating dubious occupational licensing commissions, such as those devoted to overseeing massage therapists, lighting rod salesmen, and sprinkler and irrigation fit fitters. Uh, but larger agencies that had more robust uh, interest group support uh, seemed to be more successful in gathering testimonials about their usefulness and putting together elaborate studies justifying their continued existence. Uh, and so no major agency had been eliminated by sunsetting at the time of his study. The author was cautiously optimistic in pointing out that sunset laws had sometimes produced important reforms uh, through the uh, reauthorization process, uh, procedural improvements or uh, adjustments in the uh, jurisdiction of particular agencies, and that this was a useful function of sunset review. He also pointed out however, that the states had begun repealing sunset provisions, and that did not make him optimistic about the future. At the federal level, let me quickly cite two examples of sunsetting. Uh, one, I think, is more of a failure, and the other, I think, a success. The failure, perhaps, is the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which was adopted in 1974. Uh, it was controversial, and because of the controversy uh, and because of the salience of the sunset idea at that time, uh, a sunset provision was included uh, in the mandate of the agency. Uh, four years later, when the review uh, took place, uh, uh, witness after witness excoriated the agency for its pathetic performance. Uh, it was disorganized, uh, it was uh, very slow, it had overlooked certain major scandals involving commodity trading, uh, and so forth. Uh, the SEC smelled blood in the water and argued that the uh, major functions of the CFTC should be transferred to the SEC. The Treasury Department said it should be in charge of futures trading and Treasury bonds. Um, and so it did not look good for the CFTC, but nevertheless it rallied. It, uh, it, um, uh, the commissioners all testified at great length uh, uh, to their activities and how they promised to do better in the future. Uh, both OMB and the GAO weighed in with ponderous studies saying that the agency's real problem was it was underfunded. Um, uh, and um, uh, most interestingly, the various brokers and dealers who were regulated by the CFTC all came forward in support of reauthorization. So in the end, Congress agreed to reauthorize the agency with only minor changes in its mandate, and after that, reauthorization has been routine. An interesting case of what I think is a successful sunset is the independent counsel provisions of the Ethics in Government Act. Uh, this act, which originated as the Watergate, uh, post-Watergate reforms in the 1970s, has always, always did contain a five-year sunset provision. It was reauthorized multiple times, usually with the enthusiastic support of the congressional Democrats. Uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, in 1989, the uh, constitutionality of this act was challenged. In Morrison versus Olson, uh, uh, Justice Scalia cogently explained how the act was a violation of separation of powers principles and was a generally bad idea, but no one joined his opinion. Uh, nevertheless, after the Ken Starr investigations of Whitewater and the Monica Lewinsky episode, the Democrats suddenly had a change of heart. Um, if there had been no sunset provision in the act, I, say, I think it's uncertain whether or not the act would have been repealed. It would have been easy to... Uh, condemn people voting for repeal as being as voting against investigating executive wrongdoing. But with the fortuitous uh, fact that there was a sunset provision, it was easy to let the law lapse by doing nothing, uh, which happened in 1999 
Uh, and I think this is a, an example of sunsetting uh, operating in a successful fashion. I don't know uh, how far one can generalize from these episodic uh, stories. Uh, one would need a lot more data, I think, to make a general uh, pronouncements about sunsetting. It does strike me as interesting that if you compare the CFTC experience and the uh, ethics and government, the uh, independent counsel experience, that there are two things that sort of stand out. One is that in one case, the CFTC, you had a uh, standing bureaucracy that was, had been created that was in, in a position to argue against being put out of existence. Uh, whereas under the Ethics and Government Act, there is no standing bureaucracy. Each independent council comes and goes. Uh, and so there's no institutional uh, presence there which is capable of arguing for its continued existence. The second is that the CFTC had garnered about it a collection, a sort of universe of interest groups that had a stake in the perpetuation of the agency and they were able to chime in uh, and offer their support for the continuation of the agency, whereas uh, there isn't much of an organized interest group that's in favor of independent counsel investigations of executive branch officers. Maybe there should be, but uh, people aren't that foresighted to actually join such a group uh, and contribute to its functioning. So maybe those two variables uh, help explain uh, to some extent the success and, or lack of success of um, different types of sunsets, but I, I'm cautious about drawing too many generalizations from a small database. Thank you. That's a lawsuit. Um, <laughs> thank you. I'm, um, I'm here to, uh, uh, I'm told to, to take the uh, pro side of, of, of sunset laws. So I thought maybe what I'd do is, is describe the problem before I um, describe what I feel are the solutions. Uh, th there are four problems with the, with the current state of, of uh, American positive law, in my view. The first is there's this natural tendency of law to pile up over the decades. And this is not a problem that our founders foresaw. They made, they have all the checks and balances to keep Congress from making too many laws, and they would preserve the field of freedom that way. They didn't really anticipate, other than the Jeffersonian comment referred to earlier, that after 200 years, and particularly the last 50 or 60 years, that the law would pile up like sediment in the harbor till, till everyone was more or less paralyzed. And it, it turns out that it's much more difficult to repeal a law than it is to pass it in the first place because an army of special interest surrounds each, each law and, and regulation. Exhibit A would be um, the Davis-Bacon Act from signed into law by Hoover uh, that uh, is sort of a, a labor freebie, the farm subsidies from the New Deal um, and such that keep being, they actually do expire every five years but it's not even on the table to take them off the table. They keep being um, reenacted. Re and so over time, the laws have piled up, and we don't have a mechanism for dealing with it. The second problem is that all laws have unintended consequences, and the more specific they are, and laws become dramatically more specific over the course of our lifetimes, the more quickly they do become obsolete. Um, something like special ed laws, I, we would all probably be in favor of a law that requires education for special needs children. Uh, but the people who passed the law did not contemplate uh, where we are today, which is that 20% of the K-12 budget in this country is used for special ed, less than one half of 1% for gifted children, and almost nothing for pre-K education. Is that a reasonable allocation of our educational priorities? I don't think so, but no one's even asking the question. The law was passed, it had an open-ended mandate, and that's where it's gone. The third um, problem that occurs is our, we have limited resources. Budget priorities change, and yet the budgets are cast in legal concrete. You get elected to Congress, you become a governor, you find that the great majority, 80 to 90 percent of the budget, is actually preset. It's not even voted on most of the time because of these laws passed in, in generations, and they don't come up again. And finally, over time, there's a lack of coherence to law when it piles up. I don't think it's really too much of an overstatement to say that American federal law and regulation more closely resembles a junk pile than it does a code for the conduct of our society. Um, I'm not a, quote, deregulator. I think uh, government regulation has a really important role 
in our society, but you have to be sympathetic with Senator Cornyn when he points out that there are 42 separate federal programs to improve teacher quality. I had one of my researchers recently count the number of words of binding federal law and regulation. It's 140 million words and counting. It's highly specific. So what you have is something that might be characterized as democracy by dead people. You have all of these laws and regulations written by people who are no longer with us. Of course, our founders are no longer with us, but they didn't give us highly specific laws that told us how to spend our money. They gave us general principles about the conduct of society. The laws and regulations we're talking about dictate the budget, dictate priorities, dictate virtually everything important about the conduct of our society. So in my view, the, 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 the goal of a spring cleaning or a sunsetting is absolutely vital to solving many of the problems on the table, but it's not even on the agenda. Everyone treats anything that's gone through the democratic process as if it's, as if it's one of the Ten Commandments, except it's like one of the Ten Million Commandments. So, what's the solution? First, no procedure is a solution. Um, the experience with sunset laws, which are one of the solutions, is that it depends on who's applying it. Texas has apparently done a pretty good job. They've eliminated 54 agencies. They have a law that says all departments expire every dozen years. Um, 54 agencies have disappeared since 1978 when they passed that law. Uh, 12 more have been, have been consolidated. In most states, the uh, sunset laws have not worked at all. The legislatures just uh, reauthorize all the laws periodically and, and nothing comes up for, uh, for any substantive debate. Now, one could put maybe a little bit more of an action forcing mechanism by doing what Judge Calabresi had, had suggested, which is giving federal courts the power. Uh, but as uh, Professor Merrill said, nobody took him up on that. Um, and I suppose you could const you make it co a constitutional requirement to do a sunset law, but then you get into all kinds of questions of of standing and imagine the, if we think we have too much litigation now, imagine everybody suing to, to try to overturn some statute they didn't like. So it's very hard to have an action forcing mechanism for sunset laws, but there are examples of successes. Uh, England has just put in some sunset laws. Uh, most German provincial states have sunset laws. They tend to work sort of practically. Uh, so there are examples and I've gone through in the last few days, painfully, several thick notebooks of all of them. Uh, and so they're not useless, but they're not ultimately efficacious because it depends on our public values. If we actually think it's important to set new priorities, then a sunset law will work. Things will come up for debate again, and we will actually change uh, the way laws work. But if it's not part of our public, um, it's not a, a priority of the public, or of our uh, political leaders, then it won't work. Uh, there are pay go there are other provisions that are smaller that have the effect of working as sunsets. Senator Warner has proposed something called a pay go provision, which would be in his uh, proposal uh, apply only to regulations. You can't um, you can't adopt a new regulation unless you get rid of an old regulation. England adopted a similar program last year, they call it one in, one out, says the wonderful acronym O-I-O-O, -O -O, or OI. Um, and, and that's actually um, worked to, they, they claim it's working, it's only, it, it's only a year old, but there is a political will to try to, um, to keep the, the number of regulations down. Chris DeMuth, uh, back uh, around 1980, proposed a regulatory budget idea, which would you would actually have Congress not only have its affirmative spending budget, but a regulatory budget where you would calculate how much was being, um, how much regulations were requiring uh, private entities to spend. You would budget it and you would allocate it. It was actually quite sensible, uh, at least conceptually. There are many practical problems. I was uh, prepared to uh, promote that until I heard him this morning say it was completely impractical and would never work. Um, uh, so 30 years later, I guess uh, Chris is uh, 
reconsidered. And the final um, variation on the theme, which is the one that I plan to promote and I think makes the most sense given where we are today, uh, might be called a sunset law rather than sunset laws. Uh, I think we need a major recodification of the laws of the United States, at least those that have budgetary implications. Nothing is working the way it should. And it's not only because, not mainly because we're addressing the wrong goals, it's because the laws are out of date. I mean, the Clean Air Act is very old, it's very clunky. You could replace probably hundreds, perhaps even thousands of pages of rules under that act with a carbon tax. As, as one example, OSHA has thousands of rules that tell everybody exactly what to do, including a rule that says stairwells shall be lit by either natural or artificial illumination. It's really helpful. Uh, most of those rules, perhaps all of them, or not all of them, but most of them could be uh, probably encompassed within a, a general regulatory principle, facilities and tools shall be reasonably suited for the use intended in accord with industry principles, giving a measure of authority to inspectors to go in and have arguments about that and to give tickets and a dispute resolution mechanism instead of having these very thick rule books. You could go down the line. You couldn't, you can pick up any volume of the CFR, almost any volume of the U.S. Code, open it up and ask the question, is this a public priority? Sometimes it will be yes, often. And then secondly, is this the sensible way of doing it? The answer to that will almost always be no. No one would write the legal system, the statutory and regulatory system that we have today. No one would design it this way. It doesn't work very well. It's, uh, it's crippling our society economically, or at least hindering it, not for reasons stated by the Republican candidates, not because, again, they're addressing the wrong goals, but because it's way too specific. It's a version of central planning. So I think we need to do what Justinian did a long time ago and Napoleon did not so long ago, and, and at least in one area of what the Uniform Commercial Code did maybe half a century ago, which is that we need to have a sunset law. We need to go and look at everything and take a decade and have a whole series of commissions in different areas and rationalize this incredible, incredibly complicated, uncoordinated, expensive, and often counterproductive system of law that we've built up over the last mainly half century and make some sense of it. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to be on today's panel. And uh, as two of the panelists have already uh, remarked to you, I've been outed as a uh, intruder panelist. Uh, the panelist who was supposed to be addressing you was Judge Guido Calabresi, the famous uncle of Stephen Calabresi, founder of the Federal Society. And so I feel very guilty that I'm going to deprive you of that experience. Uh, so uh, in, in light of that, I think, <laughs> I think what I might do is that is that uh, just close your eyes, and uh, if you close your eyes and imagine for a moment, you might imagine that Guido Calabresi is actually addressing you. <laughs> and the first thing I would like to say, I, I will get to the substance in a moment, if you will just give me a second. The first thing I would like to say is that I'm Guido and you're not. And the second thing I would like to say is that all Calabresis are much to be admired, and, and among the many landmarks of this year's Federalist Society Convention is that this is the 25th year that my nephew, my favorite and very brilliant nephew, Stephen Calabresi, the nephew of Guido, <laughs> has been the chairman of the board of the Federalist Society, and we should recognize that, and we should applaud it. All right, proof positive that uh, academics have an unfailing talent to be tendentious. Uh, continuing along that theme, uh, I want to tell a story and then I want to provide some analysis. Uh, I'm going to tell the story of one statute, and I think it 
suggest some points that might be generalized very cautiously, exactly as Tom uh, and Philip would suggest. And this is the story of one of our more famous sunsetting statutes that's not been mentioned, and that is the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, it was adopted in the wake of some uh, very tense interactions between civil rights demonstrators and southern sheriffs, uh, and in light of the fact that uh, millions of Americans were formally disenfranchised, particularly uh, Americans of color in the South. Uh, the original statute passed in 1965 uh, had a number of provisions. I'm going to focus on three. Section two of the act, as is well known, uh, barred as a matter of federal statutory law electoral and voting practices that discriminated explicitly based upon race. Uh, a second provision, section four, suspended, but only in the South, all literacy tests, which were one of the mechanisms by which voters of color were excluded, and where white voters were usually not excluded, however illiterate. And then uh, finally, section five of the statute uh, created a, a mechanism for pre-clearing of electoral changes, again, largely limited to the South, uh, either through the Department of Justice or through the District Court of the District of Columbia. Uh, the Voting Rights Act, uh, it's not a long statute, it's one of the most aggressive and innovative and regulatory statutes in recent history of the United States. Uh, it had a five-year sunset attached to it, uh, and it's arguable, uh, though I would not take this position, that the sunset uh, was one of the features that allowed the statute makers to escape the Southern filibuster and other points of opposition. Now, it comes up for reauthorization again in 1970, 1975, 1982, and then again in 2006. Uh, and each story, I think, is somewhat instructive, foreshortened a bit for time purposes. When the Voting Rights Act came up again in 1970, a very different political environment. Johnson was not president, Richard Nixon was. Uh, the Congress looked very different in 1970, in part because of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, more moderate Democrats, and I might add, I integrationist Republicans from the South in Congress, fewer openly segregationist Democrats. A number of changes were made in 1970. It was not clear the act was gonna be reauthorized. Uh, the Nixon administration was a little bit foot-draggy. Some of the representatives and senators were as well, including the chairs of the Judiciary Committees in both houses. Uh, but it ultimately did get reauthorized, and indeed it got expanded. Section 4 was expanded in the 1970 version to suspend literacy tests nationwide, no longer just limited to the South. Uh, and Section 5 preclearance was reaffirmed uh, including, at least in the legislative history, uh, ringing endorsement of the uh, liberal interpretation that had been adopted by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1969. Now, when 1975 came around and the Voting Rights Act again came up for reauthorization on this five-year pattern, uh, Section 4's um, literacy test prohibition uh, became permanent as well as nationwide. So by statute, literacy tests uh, were uh, preempted from 1975 on. And a new section was added in 1975, Section 203, uh, which now extends the vote dilution protections of the Act to language minorities and imposes affirmative requirements on communities with language minorities to assist them in uh, effectuating their right to vote. The time limit after uh, 1975 was extended to seven years. One feature of term limits, of course, is you can make the sunset anytime you want. So the next time it came up for reauthorization was during the Reagan administration in 1982. Uh, Republicans controlled the Senate, if memory serves me correctly, and of course, President Reagan was a Republican in the White House. So you would think this is when Phillips will eliminate a lot of this. And instead, exactly the opposite happened in 1982. Not only was the Voting Rights Act reauthorized after a great deal of political drama, but Section 2 was radically expanded, the biggest expansion of Section 2 in the history of the statute, to include uh, uh, the anti-discrimination rule is extended to voting rules and practices that have a disparate impact on minorities and not just that are targeted against minorities. Uh, and then Section 5 was amended to override Supreme Court interpretations which had limited Department of Justice ability to veto or District Court ability to veto uh, some of the non-retrogressive Southern changes in voting rules. Uh, in 1990s uh, and the new millennium, the Department of Justice spurred on in part by the 1982 amendments and in part by partisan pressures perhaps, 
has interpreted the Voting Rights Act even more dynamically than it had in the 60s and 70s. It was pretty dynamic in the 1970s. Uh, and has pressed the Voting Rights Act, particularly the preclearance provisions, in yet more radical directions. 2006, again, if memory serves me correctly, Republican president, I think a Republican Senate, I believe a Republican House of Representatives, not only virtually unanimously reauthorizes this massive federal intervention, but also further expands it in Section 5, for example, overruling a series of Supreme Court cases that had churlishly interpreted Section 5 more cautiously in light of original meaning. Uh, at no point in the 2006 legislative process uh, was there serious consideration given to the actual repeal of Section 5 or the Voting Rights Act in Congress. So what do we have from this? <clears throat> I want to draw three tentative hypotheses. These are not conclusions, because this is not empirical proof. But I want to draw three hypotheses from my account of the Voting Rights Act, which again, I would say, is probably the most famous of the more recent sunset statutes in terms of uh, popular understanding. Point number one. Uh, and that is that sunsetting often does not work. And here I'm going to echo Tom and add to Tom. Sunset often does not work, especially when the agency and the program which is being reviewed under a sunset provision is characterized by the following features. Feature number one, Tom's metaphor of the army of bureaucrats. Check. Uh, number two, supportive interest groups. Uh, and a wide array of interest groups, of course, uh, including conservatives, uh, supported the expansion and liberalization of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and three, adding to Tom's account, uh, the conditions for not sunsetting are greatly enhanced when there is bipartisan political support, which often occurs because the statute has been implemented by executive agencies and presidencies of different political parties over the years. Okay? Uh, exactly what you find in the case of the Voting Rights Act. And I might add the Voting Rights Act, uh, uh, legal academia has been the subject of much criticism and fun at today's conference, which is great. I've made fun of them myself. But the main critics, virtually the only critics testifying on the public record, of Section 5, and do we really need it, were liberal and conservative academics who had no traction in the political process. So all these other things, army of bureaucrats, interest groups, bipartisan support, all trump the academics. Too bad for America. Uh, these factors particularly come into play when there are credible, as there are in this case, reliance interests based upon the statute. Whole structure of Southern voting law is now based on the statute. Whole structure of bureaucrats, interest groups, lawyers, whatnot, even law professors based on the statute. Uh, and there's almost an endowment effect. Take out the almost. There is an endowment effect that inheres uh, when you have so many groups that are involved in so many of these statutory debates uh, that they've come to rely on it. So that's point number one. Uh, that there will very often be conditions, and, and indeed typically for the big, big ticket programs, uh, where sunsetting won't work. Here's the second point, and even more stunning and depressing. And that is that the sunsetting can also increase regulatory ambition, can increase agency authority. In other words, not only might sunsetting in many instances, particularly the kinds that I've identified, not lead to the rolling back of easy to criticize programs, programs that go too far. You know, Section 5 is obsolescence. Voting practices actually are better today than they were in 1965. And yet it rolled through by virtually unanimous majorities. And, and this is the key point now, the Voting Rights Act was actually liberalized. Okay? So in other words, not only might sunsetting, the opportunity for Congress to revisit a program, not weed out the programs that need to be retired, but it might actually expand them because of the factors that Tom and I have been talking about. Third point. Uh, and this is uh, somewhat, uh, uh, Philip, much more in support of what you're thinking about. And that is that I actually think, based upon the review of the Running Rights Act and others, that sunsetting, notwithstanding these problems, can still serve three useful purposes. And I want to rely on two that you mentioned, Tom mentions, and add a third one of my own. Number one is the experimentation. I think sunsetting, very useful, 
specifically in the Voting Rights Act, to experimentation. I think the idea of suspending literacy tests was a good idea. Uh, it was subject to some powerful normative arguments. It's, literacy tests, actually, you would think for an informed voting public, this might be useful. On the other hand, they might be administered in discriminatory ways. Well, who's right about that? That's an empirical question. Uh, and so they were suspended in the South, uh, and indeed, Armageddon did not come. It worked fine. Uh, voting maybe was even better in the South without literacy tests, discriminatorily applied. And the more they were talked about, the more they were studied, the better the evidence was that literacy tests uh, were not necessary in the South and other parts of the country. Uh, and uh, a degree of political consensus was achievable on the issue of literacy tests, which I might have had been upheld by the Warren Court. Uh, the liberals as well as conservatives that upheld these against uh, uh, federal attack. Uh, and yet conservatives as well as liberals, southerners as well as northerners were able to agree that literacy tests could be retired by the time you got to 1970 and even more in 1975. Uh, secondly, uh, I do agree uh, with Philip that uh, uh, sunsetting can end, can have a deregulatory purpose. It can end uh, some agencies. My friendly suggestion is uh, that if you just go statute by statute, which is the way we've been doing it, uh, it's going to be subject to the kind of pathologies that Tom and I are talking about. And your idea of maybe having massive sunsets, which of course might have other costs, I admit, um, is probably going to reduce uh, the ability of all the agencies to protect themselves against uh, this uh, massive overlook. So I think there's something to be said for that. And then here's the third point, and I'll stop. Uh, and that is that there's something to be said here for democracy. Uh, one of the realities you have to confront here uh, is that uh, when Congress passes these statutes, however specific or general they are, uh, Congress, uh, it sets afloat a, a ship in an ocean that Congress is not necessarily going to control. Uh, the steering of the ship is not by members of Congress, it's mainly by agencies. Uh, and with judges playing an important role as, as well. And so the interaction of agency interpretations, judicial pushback, agency response, uh, uh, group responses to all of this, creates a very, very different statute. And there is a genuine danger in our republic where the, the dynamic lawmaking, which is inherent in our separation of powers, removes important statutory mandates like the Voting Rights Act, from the democratic process and, and from any sense of democratic accountability. And so people like Merrill and Eskridge, and Guido Calabresi, if you wanted to include him, can criticize the way Congress operates, but Congress does have the imprimatur, not only of the Constitution, but of the normative democratic accountability of the constituencies that House members and senators must face. And it's maybe not a bad idea. So if Congress chooses to liberalize the Voting Rights Act, uh, it's not like they do it in a blind spot. They do it after reviewing agency and judicial interpretations, having a debate on it, making the deals that they make. Maybe they'd be better deals. If you adopted my nephew Stephen Calabresi's idea about term limiting committees, that might be worth looking at. Uh, but it is nonetheless the deals that are ratified uh, by the democratically elected legislators who, of course, again, must face the voters. Thank you. The discussion on this panel so far uh, has concerned sunset clauses in specific statutes. Uh, but the general subject of this panel was how about a completely effective across the board federal sunset law? Something that would be framework legislation, generally applicable. The same way the Administrative Procedure Act is generally applicable, or we now have a four year st statute of limitations uh, for every statute that doesn't have its own. Uh, the fact that we have generally applicable inverse preemption in the insurance industry under the McCarran-Ferguson Act, uh, and so on. All of those framework laws are overridden on occasion, but most of the time they're not. History tells us that the framework laws generally govern most of the situations within their scope. 
So learning that sunset clauses may have made the Voting Rights Act uh, worse by making it a must-pass statute that attracts Christmas tree amendments doesn't necessarily tell us the normal effect of a comprehensive sunset statute. Law reviews are just full of lawyers' talk about this subject. And the precy for this panel sets out one of the lines of argument that a sunset law will promote the cause of classical liberalism by reducing the volume of permanent laws, by reducing the force of the dead hand in legislation. On this understanding, statutes stick around because the legislature lacks the time needed to revisit them regularly. And even when it has the time, people who occupy veto positions, think committee chairs, uh, can block change even when a majority of Congress or a state legislature would like to change. There's also a contrary possibility, that the same reasons that make laws more likely to expire under a general sunset regime, as the special prosecutor statute eventually did uh, under its statute-specific clause, also make it easier to pass laws in the first place. Laws come about when interest groups that gain from statutes can overcome the oppositions of those who will lose by the legislation. Sunset laws, if they're effective, right, if they actually work at getting rid of laws, sunset laws would reduce somewhat the expected loss from any given proposal, and therefore would reduce the opposition to the interest group agenda. Uh, Bill Askridge suggested that maybe the Voting Rights Act was in that category. It couldn't have been passed without the sunset. So we have two potential effects. Sunset laws may get rid of old laws and promote the cause of classical liberalism, but they also may make it easier to enact new laws and promote the cause of interest groups. Which one of these effects predominates? Unfortunately, we have a lot of anecdotes, we have a lot of stories about what happens with specific statutes that did or did not get sunsetted, but very little data. The difficulty with looking at individual programs such as the Independent Council Law or the Voting Rights Act is that some or all of the things that happened at their reauthorization times might have happened without a sunset clause. We don't know, it's hard to run the counterfactual. To tell, we need large samples of laws, and we need variants across jurisdictions. I went in search of studies of sunset laws. As Tom Merrill recounted, a lot of states have passed sunset laws, and it's not only states. Uh, I'm about to describe uh, a sunset law adopted by the World Trade Organization. It turns out not, uh, however, to be easy to find studies of these things. For every, oh, every roughly 100 law review articles in which there's a lot of lawyers talk about what could happen, I found about one empirical study that poses the question, what did happen? In fact, I found only three, and I'm now going to describe them for you. Uh, the World Trade Organization adopted a five-year sunset rule for anti-dumping clauses. I'm sure you're all acquainted with anti-dumping clauses. It's a form of trade barrier in which corporations in one nation complain that their competitors in other nations are charging too little for their products. You know, normally we think that the antitrust laws are going to get prices down. The role of anti-dumping laws is to get prices up. Treaties allow importing nations to impose limits, quotas, or countervailing duties uh, in the event of dumping. Which protects, which protects producers at the expense of consumers. Uh, these laws, these duties tend to stick around and produce pointless laws. So a sunset was created in the interest of freer trade. There are thousands of these cases, so it turns out that a statistical analysis is possible. A study found that at the sunset review, many duties are allowed to expire, in fact more countervailing duties are allowed to expire than continue. That, and that result is statistically significant. And that sounds encouraging, doesn't it? But it also turns out that the only duties that are allowed to expire are the unimportant ones, 
the ones that really injure consumers remain. And on average, at the five-year review, they get worse. The net effects are unclear, but this study is not encouraging. And this study, like the other two I'm going to mention, was entirely ex post. That is, it asks what happens to duties that already exist. It did not ask whether the prospect of a five-year sunset makes the adoption of countervailing duties more likely in the first place. This means that we don't know the full effects even of the WTO sunset clause. And this is, by the way, I think the best empirical study of any sunset law, and we just don't know the full effects. But here's another study about regulatory systems. Most states require real estate brokers to be licensed. The stated public rationale for that is that it improves the quality of service. Uh, the unstated possibility is that this allows the incumbents to reduce the amount of new competition and jack up their prices. And in some states, this licensing scheme is subject to sunset. Well, what is the effect? So far, in every state that's reviewed, re reviewed these schemes at a sunset time, the program of licensing and the agency that administers the program have been reauthorized 100% of the time. But there is a small effect. In the year of the review, uh, the agency is a little bit more willing to allow new competition. Uh, so, you know, maybe they're more sensitive to the public during the year of the review. And so consumers get a small benefit maybe one year in five. But the program is there. The dominant force is the program sticks around and the power of exclusion uh, remains. I mean, it's not as good as free competition, but it turns out to be somewhat better for consumers than states that lack sunset review. Now, finally, expenditures. 30 states at one time or another have had some form of sunset review of their expenditures. And you can think of that as a kind of program-specific zero-base budgeting exercise at intervals between four years and 12 years, depending on the state. What's the effect of this? Well, once again, programs never end and agencies never close. But again, just as with real estate brokers, in the year of reauthorization, uh, there's some, though small, reduction in expenditures and some, though small, increase in bureaucratic efficiency. I mean, it seems, the review process seems to override just a little bureaucratic inertia. Not much, but the direction is, is a good one. Oh, and this study made one other interesting finding. Twelve states that have had sunset laws have allowed those laws to sunset. It seems that the only category of laws that sunset laws regularly eliminate is sunset laws themselves. <laughs> Apparently, even mild belt tightening leads to powerful opposition. Now, the bottom line of all of this is unclear. We know that some kinds of sunset laws have some modest benefits ex post. The emphasis must be on modest. But we don't know the ex ante effects. We don't know whether the prospect of sunset will lead to more or more intrusive legislation by reducing the opposition to it. And we do not know the consequences of requiring legislators to spend more of their time on the reauthorization of existing programs. If legislators have to spend more of their time thinking about whether to renew the Voting Rights Act and the Commodity Future Trading Commission and other things, Presumably, they have less time for other things. And that could mean less new mischief. But of course, it also could mean less time and energy to resist and oppose interest groups' proposals for new mischief. It also could lead to more delegation. If a legislature's time is consumed by sunset reviews, one possible response is to delegate more to agencies, which rely on staffs and, of course, the interest groups. One common finding, which you can read in the Journal of Law and Economics, which I used to edit, is that administrative delegations regularly provide benefits for interest groups at the expense of the general welfare. Uh, and you should recall some examples from the regulation panel earlier today, 
which illustrated how agencies tend to take powers to and beyond their limits. None of the studies I've mentioned test for this effect, which should give us all some pause. Perhaps we need a different form of sunset, a rule that agencies must rescind their rules unless within five years a cost-benefit study vindicates them. But we don't know the effect of that either. So I've been urging caution, uh, and the uncertainty uh, puts me in mind of Edmund Burke's maxim. Don't talk to me of reform. Things are bad enough as they are. <laughs> and there I shall stop. Thanks to all four of you for those excellent presentations. Um, I, I was going to give some of the earlier panels a chance to respond to anything. I think Philip had one or two things he might want to say. Um, well, first, in, 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 in reverse order, on the idea of caution, um, I'm not an academic, so I just start where we are, which is a real mess. You, know, you can't approve a power line without seven to ten years of review. You can't maintain control of the classroom if you're a teacher because of the way due process rules have evolved. Uh, the healthcare system is drowning in, in, in bureaucracy. So, um, so I see a dysfunctional system uh, in part as a result of um, all these laws written in the past. And while I take Judge Easterbrook's uh, point about unintended consequences of sunset laws, I, compl I think every point he made is valid. Unfortunately, the tens of thousands of laws on the books have had similar unintended consequences, and now they're sitting there. So the question is, what do you d do with it? And we don't now have any, even a debate on the table about how to, how to clean it out. And the idea of an omnibus sunset law, I, I said, does not, I think is not a, it's not a panacea, but I do think that one has to achieve a, um, a, uh, a, a new public purpose to clean out the law, and that new public purpose should probably be reflected in law. And, and I didn't think that Professor Eskridge's um, um, excellent uh, recounting of, of how the Voting Rights Act evolved um, undercuts the idea to review laws at all. It, it, the law was effective, and they decided to make it more effective and to expand the parts that they found effective. Uh, I think that I don't, I'm not against getting rid of all laws. I'm against seeing how they work. Sometimes they might work better. Great, let's expand them. Um, so again, I don't think there's a panacea, but I don't think this is an academic or, or abstract issue in our country now. Uh, all these laws are, in the, are on the books, and they are uh, establishing how our society works day to day. And in my view, they're not working very well. Bill or Guido, do you want to respond? I'll respond as Bill. Um, I do think uh, uh, that um, the Voting Rights Act, Philip, does have this cautionary story. A lot of people, including me, think that Section 5 um, which might have been justified, I think was justified in 1965, when only minorities of voters of color were allowed to vote in the South, uh, is nearly as justified day. It's a classic example of what you're complaining about. It's a classic example of Guido Calabresi's obsolescence. Um, because today the voting uh, numbers are pretty comparable. And indeed, the minority voting numbers in the South, which are the only jurisdictions covered by Section 5, are better than they are in certain parts of California and states outside the South, which are not covered by Section 5. So at the very least, it seems to me there needs to be a rethinking of Section 5. And that's exactly what didn't happen. Moreover, every time I believe that Congress has revisited Section 5, it has either reaffirmed liberal judicial interpretations that expand it. In other words, as the problem is getting less, Section 5 is getting broader. And in the 2006 authorization, there was a big expansion of Section 5 to override Supreme Court cases that uh, had narrowed it. So uh, I think the, 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 the two things are that this is a perfect example of a statute that I think is obsolescent in part and where the sunsetting process has actually exacerbated the obsolescence uh, 
and not solved it. Now, to tie it again to uh, Cousin Guido's uh, book, the irony is, and this is a deep irony, is the Roberts court seems to be on the verge of playing the Guido Calabresi role. So you pay, say people have not embraced it. That's wrong. I think the Roberts court is going to be embracing Guido Calabresi's theory if they strike down Section 5 as unconstitutional, which would be a Guido move, right? Uh, and so that's what actually might happen. The court, uh, the Rehnquist and the Roberts courts both cut back on Section 5 fairly steadily. Not in huge ways, but they cut back on it. And their cutbacks have basically been overridden by Congress as part of the sunsetting process. So the stakes are now higher, and they've suggested in the Northwest Austin case, where they engaged in a ridiculous exercise in statutory interpretation, uh, that they might be willing, that they are willing to reconsider the constitutionality. And there um, might indeed be five votes to strike it down. So. I see some uh, questioners in the audience. Yes, uh, I'm Ilya Selman, George Mason Law School. This is a question for Judge Easterbrook. If I understand you correctly, your main concern about the sunset laws is that they might reduce the perceived costs of uh, passing legislation and therefore make the legislation more likely to be passed. But I'm not sure I understand how this is an argument against generalized sunset laws because presumably, even in the absence of a general sunset law, the proponents of a particular legislative proposal always have the option of including a specific sunset law if they think that's necessary to uh, a sunset provision specific to that law if they think it's necessary to overcome opposition. Uh, moreover, of course, it's the case that while a sunset law might reduce the perceived costs of the law, uh, the sunset provision might also reduce the perceived benefits so the proponents would have less incentive to lobby for it. So I, I'm not sure I understand how this is a consideration that counts against generalized sunset laws given that proponents of particular legislation always have the option of including a specific sunset clause in that particular act if they see that that's the only way that it can get passed. Uh, thank you. I, I certainly grant that sunset clauses could be included in specific legislation as indeed they may have been included in the Voting Rights Act to get it to pass in the first time. And I'm, I was trying not to figure out how likely this effect is, it's a subject on which we need data, but to flag it as one that needs attention. And I, I hope I was not understood as saying that my only concern is that general sunset clauses might reduce the costs of laws and make new interest group legislation easier. And I also said toward the end of my presentation, that another effect might be to consume extra legislative time, make them less able to evaluate interest group proposals, and when they pass something, to produce broader delegations to agencies uh, as part of a process that I think we have good data on uh, leads to losses to consumers and gains to interest groups. All of these are related issues, and it would really be nice to know how these related factors have played out in the states that have had sunset laws. I mean, the, my main observation was that we have only three useful studies, uh, and all of those are looking ex post rather than ex ante, but I've got lots of worries ex ante, not just the, the one. Tom? Uh, just quickly, I, I, I can see how a general sunset statute might reduce the value of uh, legislation to interest groups uh, uh, because it would uh, create a new source of uncertainty about how long the deal that they got from the legislature uh, would last. Uh, it's a little bit analogous to the debate uh, that was uh, triggered by the classic Posner and Landis argument about the independent judiciary from an independent from an interest group perspective, where the argument was that if judges faithfully enforce the deals that are um, uh, cooked up in the legislature, then that will enhance the value of deal making, and, and therefore interest groups will be happy. And I suppose conversely, if you had a kind of wild card judiciary in which you know some kind of 
free-floating substantive due process doctrine was always available to invalidate legislation that the judges didn't like that would reduce the value of legislation uh, to interest groups. So I can see how a general sunset statute uh, would ex ante uh, increase the enticement of um, uh, interest groups for uh, getting legislative deals. I don't, I don't think that's a mystery at all. Okay, the next questioner. Uh, John Meyer. And what we have is, is an institutional problem that we're discussing, which is we have all these, these laws, they become out of date, overwhelming. Uh, and I want to suggest there's one institutional change that, that, that might be considered uh, t to mitigate this, which would be a change in the legislative structure, where Congress and all the state legislatures institute a committee which is solely has the job of repealing laws, committee on repeal of laws, maybe with subcommittee on criminal law, civil law, and regulations. And that wouldn't have some of the problems that have been dis discussed with the, the sunset and would uh, put some legislative attention on the idea that uh, we don't just pass new things, but try to make things work better. Philip? Or I think that's a, a very constructive suggestion. Um, as I said, it needs to be, the, the consequences of old laws needs to be an important priority of legislatures, not just making new ones. So uh, that sounds like a, a constructive suggestion. Bill? I'm very skeptical of the constructive suggestion, though. Um, and I like the sunsetting idea better. So Philip, defend your suggestion. The problem with um, having a committee to repeal laws this is kind of a, a non-starter from the point of view of two of the powerful engines of the legislature, and that is the incentive to be reelected on the part of the legislators and the interest group pressures on the part of interest groups. Uh, and it figures in with the veto gate structure of Congress. Uh, this would not be a very popular committee, the committee to repeal laws, because this is a committee, it's gonna be populated by people who wanna take things away uh, from interest groups and from legislators who want to get re-election. And it just, th that structure is, I think, a structure that's, that's doomed to irrelevance. Uh, and indeed, I think, based upon uh, the Voting Rights Act and environmental statutes and others, that the committee to repeal laws would quickly be captured by legislators who want to use it as a committee to reevaluate laws and then add to them like the Christmas tree effect that we've already been reporting. So that makes me pessimistic as well. Uh, Frank, Frank and then Tom. Yes, I, I would be pessimistic for a, a similar reason, uh, but I, I wonder whether you couldn't get more mileage by emulating Frank Herbert, who's a writer of science fiction uh, very famous for the Dune series, but in some of his non-Dune books, he envisaged a government that had the legislature and the executive, uh, but it also had a third branch, not the judiciary, but the third branch was called the Bureau of Sabotage. The, Bureau, the job of the Bureau of Sabotage was to get in the way of the legislature and the executive, which had become too efficient and too amenable to interest groups. And one, one could think of the way in which a Bureau of Sabotage could be uh, implemented. I mean, think of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs uh, in, right, next to the White House. Its job is to do some cost-benefit analysis of rules before the rules are adopted. Well, before the rules are adopted, people are most likely making up numbers about whether these rules are good or bad. Can you imagine a statute which said that every federal statute or every rule is five years after it's adopted, subject to a cost-benefit analysis by some independent bureau, try to make it as independent as the Bureau of Labor Statistics is, and it automatically winks out unless, this is, unless the cost-benefit analysis is passed. I imagine that Bill Askrich will say, no one in Congress would ever vote for the Bureau of Sabotage, so... Oh, Ron, Ron Paul would vote for it. <laughs> Come on. Okay. Uh, but and Rand Paul would vote for it. That's one in each chamber. I will take back the no one. <laughs> he, w he will say that less than a majority would vote for these laws <laughs> for the reasons he's already described. 
And the, the problem in, in politics in general is that the kind of laws that people are going to adopt, and we know that at one point a majority of states had sunset laws, those kind of framework laws will be the laws that don't have any serious effect or that have an effect that many of us in this room would view as baleful. And the kind of laws that would have a serious effect in moving legislation in the direction of classical liberalism won't get adopted. And that, of course, since I've already referred to one British politician, I should refer to another. You know, that's the kind of thing that got Winston Churchill to say that democracy is the worst form of government ever devised, except for every other form. Tom, did you have anything? Yeah, just quickly, one thing we haven't talked about, and your proposed committee brings it to mind, is uh, uh, my former colleague at Northwestern, Fred McChesney, uh, had a theory that went beyond rent-seeking to what he called rent extraction, which was when politicians would threaten to uh, take away certain benefits from uh, interest groups uh, and then would gar garner lots of contributions and then would uh, 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 remove the threat. So your committee would be a perfect assignment for uh, congressmen and or legislators who actually wanted to engage in rent extraction. They could threaten the sunsetting of all sorts of programs and then collect uh, oodles and oodles of contributions in order to not propose uh, the sunsetting of these programs. Lest one think this is far-fetched, some of the tax literature I looked at uh, uh, from the more recent decades suggests that these uh, uh, research and development tax credits that always had sunset provisions. People couldn't figure out why they were also always sunsetted every two years because there seemed to be an overwhelming support in Congress for this tax credit. Mm -hmm. And the explanation was, well, you know, uh, the fact that it was uncertain and it might expire every two years kept the, keeps the money flowing into the appropriations committees. Well, if, if you do try that committee, instead of a committee to repeal or a committee of sabotage, you might try to frame it a little differently, uh, specific to this convention topic of, um, a committee about returning power to the states. So you're not, you may be taking power from somebody, but you're giving it back to somebody else. The gifts are still there to be given. And the cost benefit analysis each, fi every five years would be about whether the federal government can do a better job delivering these goods than the states. And I'm not sure how that would work, but it might work a little better than a committee of repeal. Let's try the next questioner. Hi, this is John McGinnis, Northwestern. I just want to put two other issues on the table about sunset. I know people here will be shocked, shocked, but. Uh, I understand that vote trading goes on in Congress, <laughs> and the question would be by having uh, omnibus sunset, you would give opportunities, I think, for more vote trading, the literature on whether that's normatively good or bad, but it would complicate the question. There might be other laws that would come into effect because of sunset provisions. The other question is the legislative inertia also creates at least a somewhat of a veil of ignorance about what people's condition is going to be in the future, given that the laws don't have a clear date of um, being gotten rid of. A sunset provision would get rid of this inertia, and you might think that a veil of, of some veil of ignorance actually creates uh, an incentive to look at the public interest rather than your own particular parochial interest when voting for a law. Try their hand at that. I think we're just getting agreement. <laughs> Next questioner. I'm Sam Miarelli, a law student at Santa Clara. One of the things that this brings to mind for me is the overcriminalization or the overfederalization of criminal law. And you know, many of these sort of out there statutes are passed in a maelstrom of media hype over a particular victim for whom the law is named after and promptly forgotten about by everyone but the prosecutors. What do you think the impact would be of a provision like these sunsets on those sorts of criminal laws? Well, here we have no uh, interest group. There's no uh, felons for Congress. Yeah, and we have no <laughs> laws like that <laughs> to get rid of these. That's right. <laughs> All right, good. Here's the problem with that. I think that's <clears throat> well, one very interesting way of thinking about this is to think about it area by area. So maybe it does look like for licensure laws, there's a modest effect at the state level. So that, that's very useful. What about in criminal laws? Well. I think there'd be problems with that. If there were sunsetting for criminal laws, uh, the motivations in Congress, uh, at least in, in your lifetime, have been overwhelmingly to produce more criminalization. So if you had sunsetting for criminal laws, you would have these Christmas trees that have been created over you know, several legislative sessions. Then when they come for reauthorization, it's very difficult to get people you know, once it's on the agenda, 
to vote to terminate, you know, not to, not to terminate them. Like, you can see the campaign for re-election. You know, Representative Easterbrook, uh, chair of the committee, uh, is allowing convicted, like, baby sellers, like Judge Posner, or convicted child pornographers to roam the streets because he didn't bring this bill back up for reauthorization because of some liberal, like, Latinate concept called obsolescence. And it would be toxic. It would be toxic. So, the, and, and here's the way I think the criminal law often tends to work. The way the criminal law often tends to work, Congress passes these very broad statutes, very Christmas tree statutes, some of which it has really very fuzzy ideas about how it's going to work at all. Over time, some, some of the worst of them uh, do decline because prosecutors just simply stop bringing prosecutions and or judges under the rule of lenity start interpreting those statutes narrowly. Uh, we saw that, for example, with the mail and wire fraud laws uh, that were infinitely expandable in some ways based upon their vague language. Um, and the courts, Supreme Court taking the lead, started interpreting more narrowly. Well, Congress overrode it. You know, liberal Democrats, conservative Republicans alike voted to expand the mail fraud law in a very unproductive enterprise that the Supreme Court just recently re-narrowed in the Skilling case. And then we'll see what happens. So, uh, in my opinion, the best hope in an imperfect system, this is very Burkean, for narrowing um, these obsolescent criminal laws uh, tends to be uh, the prosecutors losing interest in prosecuting them and judges interpreting them narrowly or sometimes as you see, for example, in the animal, the uh, torturing animals cases, Chief Justice Roberts actually threw the entire law out uh, uh, because it was excessively vague. Um, and it seems to me that's a more workable um, sort of enterprise than, than sending them back to Congress where the pressures are really very strong uh, uh, not to allow criminal laws to lapse. But instead, my point that was made about the Voting Rights Act, to add on to them. So I think it would become even more like a Christmas tree if you had a sunset sort of situation. <clears throat> Phil? Um, I, I'd just like to mention one thing that has not gotten uh, raised in this discussion yet, which has been um, a critical component of every successful um, recodification or, or spring cleaning of law, which is uh, all this depressing discussion about rent seeking and rent extraction <laughs> and uh, the other mechanisms of our Congress uh, make me want to remind that all these, all good events in cleaning up law have occurred by special commissions. They've actually been approved by whoever was in charge, but not actually negotiated by people who were in charge. They were, whether it was the you know, the, the committee of the UCC that then got all the state legislatures to adopt it because uniformity was important, or back through history when, when rulers appointed four jurists, I think, in the case of Napoleon and two in the case of Justinian to, uh, to actually recodify the law. And I think that is actually the only way you get criminal laws or something like that cleaned out because the legislative motives are all towards trying to appear tough, notwithstanding what everybody will say in the back room. Next question. Uh, Mark, <clears throat> Mark Chenoweth, I'm a Chief of Staff for a member of Congress. Uh, quickly to John Meyer's point, uh, Governor Brownback in Kansas has established an executive office of the repealer, so it wouldn't have to be a legislative tax subsidies. Any reactions, Phil? Well, that's a, you're right. <laughs> um, so, it's, you know, you're right. The, the, the incentives are all wrong, but in the case of ethanol, there's a, there's a strong um, group against the subsidies. Uh, maybe if, if what Judge Easterbrook suggested, which is that there were a cost benefit required post hoc uh, cost benefit analysis, you know, someone would look at it and say, geez, this costs more, this uses more energy than it gives, and therefore it wouldn't, wouldn't survive the substantive due process challenge or the, however the laws, um, however the sunset law is, is written to, to mandate uh, overturning. Next question. Oh, go ahead. Could I add briefly that uh, the, the proposition that one Congress can't bind another is not entirely true. Uh, one Congress can authorize a project 
uh, and appropriate funds for it that are then uh, put into a contract. So if there's a contract to build an aircraft carrier in year one, and Congress decides in year five to cancel it, uh, the United States still has to pay the contract price or you know, whatever turned out to be the damages for breach of contract. So long-term commitments are possible. You could imagine a statute of the sort that said, uh, for our uh, ethanol subsidy, the ethanol subsidy lasts for five years. Uh, if this firm, if whichever firm is receiving the ethanol subsidy, accepts an ethanol subsidy for a sixth year, it has to give back all the money it received in years one through five. And in order to get the subsidy in years one through five, you have to sign this contract. So you could imagine devices that would have the effect of locking in a terminal period. But as our earlier discussion goes, I think the more effective one can imagine any of those devices being, the less plausible it is that ever be adopted. And next question. Steve Calabresi at Northwestern. Uh, <laughs> my, my question was, um, there are a couple of analogous areas where Congress has struggled with how to deal with pressing uh, public problems. I was thinking particularly of military base closings, approval of free trade accords with other countries, and also harmonizing criminal sentences. And in the base closing context, a commission was established which would propose cutting a certain number of ba bases and that would just go for an up or down vote to each house. That seems to have worked out to be fairly successful. Uh, the sentencing commission could be debated more, but it does seem to have brought some coherence and uniformity to federal sentencing of a kind that Congress never could have done without the existence of the commission. And with respect to uh, free trade agreements, the fast track approval of free trade agreements has allowed more free trade agreements to get through Congress than might otherwise have happened. So my question is, what about having a commission once every five years or once every 10 years that proposes sunsetting to Congress um, for an up or down vote by both houses? That might be a way of getting away from the uh, piecemeal interest group protection of each individual program if you simply had one major sunsetting pr proposal at one time. Any reactions, Tom? Uh, yeah, one, one uh, drawback to that is that um, at least this one study of the state sunset law suggests that uh, one of the benefits of sunsetting is that it actually does engage the legislature in uh, uh, examining how well a program is functioning. And so they hold hearings and they take testimony about this. And, and frequently, it seems that the, uh, the result is not to terminate the agency. That seems to be the, the rare outcome. But much more commonly, uh, they would make adjustments in the, in the program. They would you know, eliminate some procedural glitches. They would clear up some statutory ambiguities. They would clarify jurisdictional scope and so forth. So that's an advantage of having the actual legislative committees uh, have a sort of hands-on engagement rather than just kind of an up or down. Philip's suggestion of codification, however, seems to me something that you might uh, implement through something like you're talking about, that you could have a kind of law revision commission that would try to rationalize the Clean Air Act, for example, which is this unbelievable monstrosity, like many other federal statutes are, um, and, you know, pare it down to something much more uh, sensible and then uh, present it to Congress on something like an up or down vote. Maybe that, that might work uh, as a way of that streamlining the law a bit. Yeah. Our, all right. The, you could imagine a, a parallel to the base closing commission working if it could concentrate on particular fields, right? One reason why it's so hard to get rid of agricultural subsidies uh, is that the farmers are unwilling to give up their share of the pork without making sure that everybody else gives up a share as well. You could imagine a commission that would propose getting rid of agricultural subsidies at the same time as they got rid of pointless environmental rules that made agriculture more expensive. You could imagine it. <laughs> But, but you, you may remember the history of the Base Closing Commission is not as, as rosy as Steve Calabresi suggested. Uh, 
there were some initial rounds of base closing, and they proved so controversial that the procedure has now been substantially hobbled, uh, and the cycles don't occur as they did anymore. Uh, and it, it's possible members of Congress will have learned, but the, the Calabresi proposal uh, certainly sounds like one that ought to be investigated. It would be wonderful to know if anything like it has ever been tried uh, in any other nation or the states. It certainly sounds like it has some prospects, more so than the ones we've been discussing on this panel so far. <laughs> yeah, I would um, add to that that there might be some state experience. Uh, we can't identify it. I think New York State had a law reform commission, which is somewhat different from what you're talking about. Yeah. Maybe a hybrid between what Philip's talking about and what you are. Um, I would suspect, but I've never studied it, I don't even know what it, it did exactly, but I, I suspect that what happened in the New York Law Reform Commission, a lot of minor tinkering, um, more ministerial, uh, filling out the details. So the U.S. Sentencing Commission doesn't, you know, affect the gross sentences or the enhancements or all those other things. It's merely trying to bring coherence, which can, can be made to sound technical. Even though if you're being sent away for 20 years, it's not a technicality, right? Now, don't you laugh, Mr. LSD case. Um, so that's, I think the, the law reform commission would work better in those kind of cases. And I also want to issue a corrective on the UCC. The, there's usually a very interesting and interest group driven story, even for the successful law reform ideas. Now, my source for this is Grant Gilmore, who was the author, he's my contracts teacher and the author of Article 9 of the UCC. And Gilmore claimed, and I've read some of the historical records that support this claim, uh, though someone should do a history, that Llewellyn's Article 2 and the rest of the UCC were dead in the water as far as most states outside of Pennsylvania were concerned, because the Ayatollah of the UCC was a Pennsylvania political power, got it through Pennsylvania. Uh, but that the reason the UCC went forward so widely, according to Gilmore, was the banks were desperate for a simplification of security law. That state security law was piled on top of these common law forms that were not only hard for the banks to understand, but they were ununiform from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And they desperately wanted Grant Gilmore's simplification of Article 9. But as those of you who know the UCC will recognize, Article 9 is intricately tied up with Article 2. And so, though they're not Siamese twins, you really had to adopt the entire uh, enchilada uh, to get a taste of Article 9. So even there, there's often an interest group story that you've got to tell for doing any kind of big ticket change uh, in the legislature sort of on its own. Right, but the interest groups uh, today in the legislative process are tiny interest, you know, interest groups. They're the cotton farmers. They're very detail-oriented. Mm -hmm. Um, the trick, I think, is going back to what Judge Eastbrook was suggesting, is to find, is to create a package or a commission whose mandate was such that it resembles being in everyone's general interest to do something. So if you can create an interest group that looks like the general interest, which the current legislative process and democracy doesn't, then maybe you have a chance of accomplishing something like the UCC. Well, we've got an address that's supposed to start at 415. Steve, did you want to just say one quick thing? Yeah, that's a good example. Many state cons the question was, do many state constitutions require, require at a certain period of time a new constitutional convention unless there's a vote against it? And yes, Ohio's a good example of one. There are many that do that. We've got time for one more question and one short answer, and I hope the question's short as well. Hi, I'm Fred Anso with Senate Judiciary Committee, and I worked in the committee in the 90s. And compared to the 90s, today the Judiciary Committee spends a huge amount of its time reauthorizing statutes, particularly grant statutes that represent a lot of what the Justice Department doles out to states and nonprofit organizations. One reason may be because the bill passed before and that may be something that can be done on a bipartisan basis the way other things might not. My question for the panel is what do you think about that change in a committee like the Judiciary Committee of interest to a lot of people in this room that so much of the time of the Judiciary Committee is focused on uh, reauthorizing statutes with sunsets, and now you have a House Judiciary Committee that won't reauthorize any statute for more than three years. 
Yes. It's possible, again, that this is related to uh, compliance with these uh, budget reconciliation uh, provisions, right? If these are grant authorizations, that that would have expenditure uh, implications. And so therefore, by sunsetting these things, you limit the amount of committed expenditures. And so you can squeeze it within an overall budget limitation. If it doesn't have a sunset, then it becomes more problematic. I don't know. Is that possible an possibly an explanation for this? I'm not certain because uh, the, the appropriators can still appropriate the funds and sometimes we reauthorize a year or two after the authorization expires. Well, um, thank you for attending this panel. Thank you to our excellent panelists. Great. 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 Great.